Well, I'm here to talk about the facts. The facts. Heart disease kills more women than all cancers combined. 4% of women are diagnosed with breast cancer annually, whereas 44% of women are diagnosed with heart disease. Even though heart disease has been called a man's disease, since 1984, more women have died annually from heart disease than men. In the United States, 39,520 women died of breast cancer last year, but nearly 500,000 women died from heart disease. And put another way, in worldwide figures, about 400,000 women die from breast cancer, but 8.6 million women die from heart disease. Given these statistics, only 24% of participants in all heart-related studies are women. For 50 years, women have been treated based on diagnostics created for men. And surveys of available data show that a very small percentage of research dollars spent in the United States focus on the treatment of women with heart disease. So what is wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture is the outrageous gender inequality that women face in the treatment of heart disease. I consider myself a well-informed person, sort of, <laughs> but uh, when I heard these facts, I was stunned. Very few people seem to know this. And until recently, almost no one talked about or paid attention to an epidemic that women are dying from throughout the world. Women have made enormous strides. We've had women explore the depths of outer space. A woman has run for president of the United States, and a woman has served as a speaker of the house. Yet, a boys' club still exists in the medical sciences. When I learned this, I knew I had to get involved and try to do something to change this picture. I believe that those with a platform in the entertainment industry have the privilege of being able to speak out against inequality, discrimination, and injustice. And that's why I have chosen to speak out on this issue. The number of women dying from breast cancer has significantly declined over the years because of people speaking out, sharing their stories, and the enormous amount of money that is raised for research and early detection efforts. Last year, an estimated $1.7 billion was raised for breast cancer alone, and that's great. But only a small fraction of that amount was raised for women's heart disease. We desperately need the same kind of coordinated campaign. And so in, in 2008, I endowed a, a research and education program at Cedars-Sinai Women's Center, Women's Heart Center, under the leadership of Dr. Noelle Barry Mers, who was doing life-saving work in this field. Throughout my life, gender inequality has always concerned me, whether it's making a movie about it or becoming involved in women's issues. And in this case, gender really does matter when it comes to medical science. How can you treat a woman for a life-saving, a life-threatening Sorry, let me start that again. How can you treat a woman for a life-threatening ailment based on research done on men? Especially when women's hearts are physiologically different than men's hearts. Women tend to have blockages not only in their main arteries, but also in the smaller arteries that supply blood to the heart, a condition called microvascular disease. And you'll hear more about that from Dr. Maris. Because of, this, because of this, heart disease presents very differently in women than in men. 71% of women experience early warning signs of a heart attack with sudden onset of extreme weakness that feels like the flu, <coughs> often with no chest pain at all. Unlike the Hollywood um, you know, heart attack we are all accustomed to seeing in movies, 
and television where the man grips his chest and uh, you know falls to the floor. Most women who have heart attack experience uh, nausea, vomiting, sweating, and lightheadedness. Nearly two-thirds of the deaths from heart attacks in women occur among those who have no history of chest pain. Most women don't know this, and oftentimes, by the time they enter the emergency room, their hearts have suffered substantial damage. Even if they go to their doctor who is well-intentioned, they are often misdiagnosed. I've met patients who have uh, consulted two or three cardiologists, and they are still misdiagnosed because many doctors are not given the proper training to know the warning signs in women. Heart research done on women also helps men as well. Take stem cell research, for example. Recently, Dr. Meres and I were talking about the work of a colleague who is trying to grow the first human heart in a Petri dish. She had a breakthrough in her study when she found out that using only female stem cells was the solution. <laughs> How powerful is that, girls? Because she discovered that using male stem cells didn't work. They got totally lost. <laughs> this is true. And as we know, men, even male stem cells, won't ask for directions. It's true, funny but true. So joking aside, the heart is an amazing organ. And first and foremost, we need to focus on prevention. Women's lives are becoming increasingly demanding as they juggle um, the responsibilities of being wife, mother, and helping to support the family. We need to take better care of ourselves. We need to slow down, reduce stress, eat better, make time for exercise. Because the heart is a, a precious organ that needs to be protected. Recently, I read an article um, authored by sociology professor Mitch Hall, and I found that his insights, um, which are reinforced by various academic sources, really fascinating. So I'm going to quote a few here. He wrote, as we develop in utero, the human heart is the first organ to begin forming. In traditional Chinese medicine, the inner spiritual core of the self is deemed to reside not in the head, but in the heart. He goes on to say, the heart does not just pump. What it does is listen. He suggests that the heart senses and integrates our thoughts, our emotions, and our will to carry out tasks. The heart actually is a sensitive integrator of all our experience. Ancient cultures saw the heart as the seat of the soul. A human being has dual hearts. The first, a pulsating fist of muscle in the chest. The second, a precious cabal of communicating neurons that create feeling, longing, and love. Many idioms attest to this second heart, the social emotional heart. For instance, sorrow is heartbreak. Sincere intentions are heartfelt. To be compassionate is to be open-hearted, devoid of compassion, heartless. To follow one's heart means to act on the basis of an intuitive sense of one's own most fulfilling option. He closes by saying, to hearten is to encourage, and our English word courage is itself derived from the French word cœur, meaning heart. Which brings me to the reason I am here today to introduce um, a woman with a big one. A big heart, that is. <laughs> and a thin body. Envious. Dr. Noelle Barry Mers. She is the director of the Women's Heart Center at Cedar Sinai and is helping to lead the way in closing the 50 year research gap in women's heart disease. She's a Harvard Medical School graduate, has published over 180 specific publications, and has received numerous awards recognizing her as one of the field's leading experts on preventive cardiology. 
women's heart disease, and mental stress. She is an amazing woman who can juggle a hundred different things at, all at once and still have time to raise a beautiful family. I was thrilled when I heard that this brilliant woman was doing life-saving work that would ultimately impact women all over the world. Right in our own backyard here at uh, Cedar sinai Medical Center, we can no longer afford to naively assume that heart disease is only a man's disease. Because as I mentioned earlier, it's now an epidemic facing women. So I want to thank Dr. Merz for the work she is doing to help women live longer and healthier lives. Women we love, our mothers, daughters, sisters, aunts, wives, and friends. And with that, it is my honor to introduce the remarkable Dr. Noelle Barry Merz. Thank you so much, and thank you, Barbara, as usual. Um, your leadership uh, in our work together is clearly saving lives. I'm here in this session about relationships uh, to talk about your relationship with your heart. And too often, women are not thinking about their hearts. Um, so it's a critically important relationship. Um, look to your left, look to your right. One out of two of you women will be impacted by cardiovascular disease in your lifetime. So this is the leading killer of women. It's a, a closely held secret for reasons I don't know. Um, as you know, I'm a cardiologist. In addition to making this personal, so we're going to talk about your relationship with your heart and all women's relationships with their heart, we're going to wax into the politics because the personal, as you know, is political. And not enough is being done about this. And as we have watched women conquer breast cancer through the breast cancer campaign, this is what we need to do now with heart. So since 1984, uh, more women now die in the US than men. So where we used to think of heart disease as being a man's problem, primarily, which that was never true, but that was kind of how everybody thought in the 1950s and 60s, and it was in all the textbooks. It's certainly what I learned when I was training. It's actually a woman's disease. So it's a woman's disease now. And one of the things that you see is that male line, the mortality is going down, 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 down. And you see the female line since 1984 going, the gap is widening more and more women, two, three, four times more women dying of heart disease than men. And that's too short of a time period for all the different risk factors that we know for ch to change. So what this really suggested to us at the national level was that diagnostic and therapeutic strategies, which had been developed in men, by men, for men, for the last 50 years, and they work pretty well in men, don't they? Yeah. Weren't working so well for women. So that was a big wake-up call in the 1980s. Heart disease kills more women at all ages than breast cancer. And the breast cancer campaign, again, this is not a competition. We're trying to be as good as the breast cancer campaign. We need to be as good as the breast cancer campaign to address this crisis. Now, sometimes when people see this, I hear this gaff. They, we can all think of someone, uh, often a young woman, who has been impacted by breast cancer. We often can't think of a young woman who has heart disease. I'm going to tell you why. Heart disease kills people, often very quickly. So the first time heart disease strikes in women and men, but well, we're talking about women today, it's uh, half of the time it's sudden cardiac death. No opportunity to say goodbye, no opportunity to take her to the chemotherapy, no opportunity to help her pick out a wig. Breast cancer, mortality is down to 4%. And that is the 40 years that women have advocated. Uh, Betty Ford, uh, Nancy Reagan stood up and said, I'm a breast cancer survivor and it was okay to talk about it. Uh, and then physicians have gone to the bat. We've done the research. We have effective therapies now. Women are living longer than ever. That has to happen in heart disease and it's time. It's not happening and it's time. 
we owe an incredible debt of gratitude to these two women. I know, I got it on the web. <laughs> so, um, as, as Barbara depicted in one of her amazing movies, uh, Yantol, in order to get treated like a man, and she portrayed a young woman who wanted an education. And she wanted to study the Talmud, and so how did she get educated then? She had to impersonate a man. She had to look like a man. She had to make other people believe that she looked like a man, and she could have the same rights that the men had. Bernadine Healy, Dr. Healy, is a cardiologist, and right around that time in the 1980s that we saw women and heart disease deaths going up, 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 she wrote an editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine and said, the Yentl syndrome, women are dying of heart disease two, three, four times more than men. Mortality is not going down, it's going up. And she questioned, she hypothesized, is this a Yentl syndrome? And here's what the, the story is. Is, is it because women don't look like men, they don't look like that male pattern heart disease that we've spent the last 50 years understanding and getting really good diagnostics and really good therapeutics, and therefore they're not recognized for their heart disease and they just pass. They don't get treated, they don't get detected, they don't, they don't get the benefit of all the modern medicine. Dr. Healy then subsequently became the first female director of our National Institutes of Health. And uh, this is the biggest biomedical enterprise research in the world, and it funds a lot of my research. It funds research all over the place. Um, it was a very big deal for her to become director. And she started um, in the face of a lot of controversy, the Women's Health Initiative. And Every woman in the room here has benefited from that women's health initiative. It told us about hormone replacement therapy. It's informed us about osteoporosis. It informed us about breast cancer, colon cancer in women. Uh, so a tremendous uh, fund of knowledge uh, despite, uh, again, the, so many people told her not to do it. It was too expensive. And, and the, you know, the underwriting was women aren't worth it. She was like, no, sorry, women are worth it. Well, there was a little, a little piece of that Women's Health Initiative that went to National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, which is the cardiology part of the NIH. And we got to do the WISE study. And the WISE stands for Women's Ischemia Syndrome Evaluation, and I have chaired this study for the last 15 years. It was a study to specifically ask what's going on with women. Why are more and more women dying of ischemic heart disease? So in the WISE, 15 years ago, we started out and said, well, wow, you know, there's a couple of key observations and we should probably follow up on that. And um, our colleagues uh, in Washington, D.C. had uh, recently published that when women have heart attacks and die, compared to men who have heart attacks and die, and again, this is, you know, millions of people happening all, every day, Women in their fatty plaque, and this is uh, their coronary arteries, so the main blood supply going into the heart muscle, women erode, men explode. You're going to find some interesting analogies in this physiology. <laughs> so, so I'll describe the male pattern heart attack first. You know, Hollywood heart attack, oh, you know, horrible chest pain. EKG goes, <laughs> so the doctors can see this hugely abnormal EKG. There's a big clot in the middle of the artery, and they go up to the cath lab and boom, 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 you know, get rid of the clot. That's a man heart attack. Some women have those heart attacks, but a whole bunch of women have this kind of heart attack where it erodes, doesn't completely fill with clot, symptoms are subtle, EKG findings are different, female pattern. So what do you think happens to these gals? They're often not recognized, sent home. I'm not sure what it was, might have been gas. So we picked up on that and we said, well, you know, we now have the ability to look inside human beings uh, with these special catheters called uh, IVUS, intravascular ultrasound. And we said, we're going to hypothesize that the fatty plaque in women is actually probably different and deposited differently than men. And because of the, the common knowledge of how women and men get fat, when we watch 
people become obese, where do men get fat? Right here. It's just a focal right there. Where do women get fat? <laughs> All over. <laughs> cellulite here, cellulite here. So we said, look, women look like they're pretty good about putting kind of the garbage away, smoothly putting it away. <laughs> Men just have to dump it in a single area. So we said, let's look at these. Uh, and so the yellow is the fatty plaque. And panel A is a man. And you can see it's lumpy bumpy. He's got a beer belly in his coronary arteries. Panel B is the woman, very smooth. She's just laid it down, nice and tidy. And if, <laughs> If you did that angiogram, which is the red, you can see the man's disease. So 50 years of honing and crafting these angiograms, we easily recognize male pattern disease. It's kind of hard to see that female pattern disease. So that was a, a discovery. Now, what are the implications of that? Well, once again, women get the angiogram, and nobody can tell that they have a problem. So we are working now on non-invasive. Again, these are all invasive studies. Ideally, you would love to do all this non-invasively. And again, 50 years of good non-invasive stress testing, we're pretty good at recognizing male pattern disease with stress tests. So this is cardiac magnetic resonance imaging. We're doing this at the Cedars-Sinai Heart Institute in the Women's Heart Center. Um, we uh, selected this for the research. This is not in your community hospital, but we would hope to translate this, and we're about two and a half years into a five-year study, that uh, this was the only modality that can see the inner lining of the heart. And if you look carefully, you can see that there's a black blush right there, and that is microvascular obstruction. The, the syndrome, the female pattern now is called micro microvascular coronary dysfunction or obstruction. The second reason we really liked MRI is that there's no radiation. So unlike the CAT scans, x-rays, thalliums, for women uh, who breast is in the way of looking at the heart, every time we order something that has a, even a small amount of radiation, we say, do we really need that test? So we're very excited about MR. You can't go and order it yet, but this is an area of active inquiry where actually studying women is going to advance the field for women and men. Now, what are the consequences? <laughs> we got these from Barbara. You approved it. So, so what, are the, what are the downstream consequences then when women, when female pattern heart disease is not recognized. And this is a figure from an editorial that I published in the European Heart Journal this last summer. And it was just a, a, a pictogram to sort of show why more women are dying of heart disease despite these good treatments that we know and we have work. Um, and when the woman has female, uh, excuse me, male pattern disease, so she looks like Barbara in the movie, they get treated. And when you have female pattern and you look like a woman, as Barbara does here with her husband, they don't get the treatment. These are our life-saving treatments. And those little red boxes are our deaths. So that is the consequences. And that is female pattern and why we think the Yentl syndrome actually is, is explaining a lot of these gaps. There's been wonderful news also about studying women, finally, in heart disease. And one of the cutting edge areas that we're just incredibly excited about is stem cell therapy. Women, you might imagine, if you ask, what is the big difference between women and men physiologically? Why, why are there women and men? Because women bring new life into the world. Men don't. They participate, sort of. Um, but <laughs> women, women uniquely can generate a new life and can remodel, can put the garbage where it needs to be, make a new thing, new baby, baby comes out. So, and that's all stem cells. That's all stem cells. So we hypothesize that female stem cells might be better at the identifying the injury, doing some cellular repair, or even producing new organs, which is one of the things that we're trying to do with stem cell therapy. These are female and male stem cells. 
And if you had an injured organ, if you had a heart attack and we wanted to repair that injured area, do you want those robust, plentiful stem cells on the top? Or do you want these guys that look like they're out to lunch? <laughs> and, and some of our investigative teams have demonstrated that female stem cells, and this is in animals, and increasingly we're showing this in humans, that female stem cells, when put even into a male body, do better than male stem cells going into a male body. One of the things that we say about all of this female physiology, because again, as much as we're talking about women and heart disease, women do, on average, have better longevity than men, is that the unfolding the secrets of female physiology and understanding that is going to help men and, and women. So this is not a zero-sums game in any way. Okay, so here's where we started. And remember, paths crossed in 1984, and uh, more and more women were dying of cardiovascular disease. What has happened in the last 15 years with this work? So we are bending the curve. We're bending the curve. So just like the breast cancer story, doing research, getting awareness going, it works. You just have to get it going. Now, are we happy with this? We still have two to three more women dying for every man. And I would propose with uh, the better longevity that women have overall, that just making this equal, I think is probably not gonna be the truth. W women probably should theoretically do better if we could just get treated. So this is where we are, but we have a long road to hoe. We've worked on this for 15 years, and I've told you we've been working on male pattern heart disease for 50 years. So we're 35 years behind. And we'd like to think it's not going to take 35 years. And in fact, it probably won't. But we cannot stop now. Too many lives are at stake. So what do we need to do? You now hopefully have a more personal relationship with your heart. Women have heard the call for breast cancer. And they have come out for uh, awareness campaigns. The women are very good about getting mammograms now. And women do fundraising. Women participate. They have put their money where their mouth is, and they have done advocacy, and they have joined campaigns. This is what we need to do with heart disease now, and it's political. Women's health, from a federal funding standpoint, sometimes is popular, sometimes it's not so popular. So we have these feast and famine cycles. So I implore you to join the Red Dress campaign. So there's the heart truth, which is the red dress. Go get a pin, and you can get them from our Women's Heart Center, from National Heart, Lung, and Blood, over the American Heart. And please join Barbara in this fundraising. We need to be as good, if not better, than breast cancer. Breast cancer, as we said, kills women, but heart disease kills a whole bunch more. So if we can be as good as breast cancer and give women this new charge, uh, we have a lot of lives to save. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.